Hi there. Thanks for coming back for episode two of The Very Least That I Could Do. I thought today that I'd walk you through the process of shopping for a new camera, because uh, this is a passion play that I experienced this year uh, that uh, I, I decided I, 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 for the past three or four years, I've sort of had my eye out for a really good new camera. And one year after another, after another, I really didn't see that the marketplace was making a camera that was going to be perfect for me, or at least worth my spending decent money on. Uh, and then finally, I thought that they, all the angels came together and created the, the ring of fire in the midst of, uh, in the middle of this was the four or five really good cameras, any one of which was making me really, really excited about buying a new camera. Uh, and I swear to God, it was two, it took me two or three months to pick one. And it was not like an Italian opera. It was like a German opera. It was just painful, painful, painful stuff. Uh, but it worked out well, uh, cause I wound up with this, uh, the Olympus OMD EM one, uh, which is not just one of my the favorite best cameras I've ever used. It's really one of the favorite things I've ever bought, period. Uh, and that includes any medical care I've paid for in the past few decades of my life. Um, but yeah, it was a long, long uh, route to get there. And it also, uh, taught me a little bit about how I tend to recommend cameras because now I had to really go through this as a consumer, uh, not just as uh, someone who's objectively hanging back and running his little tests and checking his little spreadsheets and putting on his fake beard so he can stroke his beard with a little sniff of brandy to figure out which am I going to pronounce as the, ob the ultimate, the ultimate, the optimate uh, camera to buy. Uh, and so I realized that uh, I and a lot of other uh, tech writers sometimes make things too complicated and we really need to cut uh, to the actual quick. So I thought I'd just, uh, I'm not going to recommend specific models because who knows, maybe someone's going to be watching this a year from now and then they will look at a specific model I'm recommending and they'll think, wasn't that the camera company that went out of business because of all the fires? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. So, some some guy lost his hair and his mustache, uh, and his least favorite dog, I think, was the problem. And, and it was his least favorite dog, but the fact that the dog ignited because of this camera, they just couldn't live that down, PR and marketing. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that. Uh, so that's why I'm not going to recommend them all. Also, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, give you some impressions that will give you sort of generic help uh, so that when you're facing this, ch this, uh, this choice, you'll have some basic information, some basic ideas that maybe will help you. Uh, and this, this, is, this is very much the, the path that I went through uh, earlier this year when I, when I bought the, the Olympus. Okay, so first of all, let, let me, let's walk through different kinds of cameras. Uh, most people use this as their regular camera, just their regular phone. Uh, and to be honest, these are all, almost all of them are really, really great phones. Some are better than others, but I mean, almost none of them are really awful. Uh, I happen to have, because I was talking about it on a podcast earlier, this is the only phone that's on the market today, the major phone that's actually quite awful. This is the Moto X which is a great, great phone. The only thing that's terrible about it is the camera, uh, because if you, woe be unto you, if you try to take a picture with this and want that to look better than what would happen if you just simply took your, the, if, if you want to take a picture of a friend of yours, if you were to get, uh, buy a newspaper, get that sheet of newsprint and just sort of smush it on your friend's face and pack it down and then peel it off and hope that whatever oils or sweat on their face would have blurred the ink to create an image of a human being, that would have been less annoying, less trouble, and probably more photorealistic than whatever image uh, the poor Moto X uh, would have come up with. Fortunately, in a couple of weeks, they're coming out with a new one, and hopefully they will have fixed that because, yikes, what a disappointment that was. But for the rest of them, some are better than others. I think the iPhone 5S right now at this second uh, and the uh, uh, the uh, Nokia Lumia 1020 are the two best neck and neck. They're just the best for different reasons. Uh, and the rest of them are not quite as good, but you put them into uh, Aperture or Lightroom or even your whatever your free desktop photo editor is and spend 30 seconds pushing sliders around and almost any camera you phone, you, every phone, any phone you buy will take pictures as good as any other phone out there. Uh, so that's not, don't, that's not something you should sweat about. So this isn't, uh, the, I'm putting it, of course, at the bottom of the list, not to denigrate the quality of these cameras, but the fact that uh, these aren't really f cameras, uh, if you know what I mean, because uh, you're familiar with this operation where you take the picture, click, and then you look at the picture that it took, and then you say, wow, it totally screwed that up. And then you take the camera and you put it back in your pocket because 
it's binary. Either the camera can take, the phone can take a good picture in this scenario or it can't take the, a good picture in this scenario. And if it can't, there's almost nothing you can do to make it take a good picture because it really isn't, it, 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 the manufacturer is not willing to compromise the idea of a slim, light, attractive, not battery hungry uh, phone f to take exceptional photos. They know that you're taking pictures and you're putting them uh, on Instagram or Facebook as if there's a difference. Uh, you're not uh, necessarily taking a picture with the thought that in 10 years or 20 years from now, this is going to be an important part of your family history uh, or of your life story. Uh, so, I mean, that's why they've got this, I mean, a, a lens that's about as big as a fruit fly's aspirations and dreams for the future. Uh, an image sensor that's not much bigger than that. The distance between the two is eensy, eensy, tiny, tiny. I'm sorry, I don't have another clever analogy uh, to make up for that. Uh, and really, it's almost has no no answers available when it can't take a good picture. It, all it can do, even the, even the iPhone, which takes great pictures, all it can do is increase the ISO, increase the crank up the sensitivity of the sensor, which increases all, which destroys a lot of detail and a lot of good color uh, in there. Uh, and you're still left explaining to your parents that, oh, well, that sort of blur that you see amongst all the high ISO noise is your granddaughter who was running around, unfortunately, and I had no way of telling the iPhone that, hey, look, this is a moving subject. Do whatever you have to do to use a nice short shutter speed. And because it doesn't have a flash or anything, it just, it, like I said, you don't have any other solutions available to you except to and you know, be the be the story light of fire. Invite people around the fire. Crouch down in your lion skins and be the the, the storyteller telling the story of the soccer match that ended with the five guys burgers. And that, because you know, your phone is not going to uh, not willing to help you. So that's why I, I my my uh, I always have to leap in and argue whenever I hear someone say, "Oh, people don't need phones these days." That's why the camera market is dying. The the camera the the, the, the don't no need cameras these days because the camera phone does everything. Thing. No, it doesn't. It takes good pictures in a, in a situation in which a bag of onions would take a good picture. Everything else, it's sort of up to chance. Um, so the next, so let's walk our way up the list of, of complexity. Uh, the next step up is a consumer grade point and shoot. Uh, this is the Nikon P6000 Coolpix that used to be my daily camera about five or six years ago. Uh, and this is everything that a phone isn't. It is solutions to problems. If you, if it, you take a picture with this and then it, you used to take a look at it and it's a terrible picture. Well, you turn this knob this way, or you turn this thing this way, or you s set a different scene mode and take it again, and guess what? It took a good picture, possibly because it had one of these, it had a flash, or it had one of those, he said, wishing that he had charged this up so you could see the zoom zooming in and out. Uh, and they make them in so many different sizes and styles. They make uh, cheap ones that cost $200 that you probably shouldn't bother with because they're barely better than the phone. Uh, they make four, the $250, $300, $400 ones that are really, really great. They make $450, $400, $450, $450 ones that have nice big zooms on them that are uh, almost like an SLR, only you can't uh, change the lenses up, but they're much, much smaller than an SLR, and they're much less expensive, and they'll do everything an SLR would really do for you if you're not terribly ambitious as a photographer. Uh, and that really is kind of the sweet spot for most consumers, because there is going to be a time, again, 10 or 20 years from now, where you will be glad that you shot a picture with your real camera instead of just trusting your phone to, you know, here is the blur that used to be uh, the full-grown woman that is now getting married. And you'll still cry because you know, you, you remember uh, what it's like to take this picture, but that's not going to help you explain to uh, your your new in-laws uh, what this uh, what this little girl was like and why she was so delightful and why you wanted to take a picture of her uh, in that in that scenario. So don't worry about anything that's $200 or less, but the, the $250 to $500 uh, range, a lot of great stuff there. Uh, I generally like uh, Canon Power Shots. I generally like Nikon Cool Picks. Uh, Panasonic has some really great Lumix cameras. Uh, and one of the reasons why I like the these cameras is that these companies have had years, like 10 years, 20 years of experience in making digital cameras, starting with the ones that were terrible. And they learned from the ones that were terrible. And now they know how to make good ones. Um, and even the ones that are not terribly expensive can have really cool features like uh, like a hot shoe uh, and, uh, you know, having a, an external flash, which is a really, really big deal. I uh, because you think that you don't need it, but then you come across a nice inexpensive flash. This is the uh, Olympus FL20, uh, 
which when new about five or ten years ago cost uh, something like 130 140 dollars if you find them on Am they're they're not being made anymore but uh, you can find them on uh, Amazon for about 130 140 but if you go on eBay you can find them for like 15 or like 30 or 40 dollars I got this one believe it or not for 18 dollars because other sellers were selling this for the more or less the going price on eBay which was about 50 or 60 another person had this matched with the Olympus uh, consumer camera that it used to be sold with uh, 10 years ago uh, and I don't have a battery I don't know if the camera works and no one was bidding on it so I got the entire thing for $18 uh, and cared so little about the camera itself that although I looked around the office to find it uh, so I could show it to you I don't know where it is it's what a sad sad commentary much much like actors and actresses after they reach a certain age they were once shiny and beautiful and sometimes you can find someone who has a quirky interest in you but otherwise you're somewhere in andy's office and he'll find you the next time he does a big cleaning good luck with that um next step up from that would probably be what you'd call a starter slr i don't have one here in the office to show you uh but i'm sure that my technical crew will put one in my hand right now Fly away, camera. My my mouth is is writing writing checks that my Final Cut Pro skills cannot cash. I cannot animate a camera going. I can probably make the camera appear in my hand so long as it sort of pops into. Uh, but I digress. Uh, yeah, so there, uh, Nikon and Canon make uh, cheap, cheap, cheap SLRs. No bones about them. They're designed to be sold to consumers as their first SLR or as, quote unquote, your family camera. Uh, Nikon has the, the 3300. Uh, the Canon has the EOS. Uh, uh, I don't even, I don't even call if they know if they don't even know if they call it EOS anymore. But these are cameras that, believe it or not, cost five hundred to six hundred dollars with a lens, a zoom lens attached that will really kind of uh, approximate what you get with uh, one of these, uh, only in an SLR form factor. And I have to admit that I'm not entirely sure how to recommend these to people because I think that they were really really quite relevant five or six or seven years ago when everybody needs a a soft entry point into getting a quote nice camera and knowing that your destination is ultimately going to be a nice canon or nikon slr it's nice to have a very simplified slr that still takes uh nikon and canon lenses so that when you do buy the nice slr you can uh, bring your lenses up with you uh but the i got i have two problems with them number one being that uh, I've never seen a Nikon or Canon consumer SLR where I thought that they tried to make a really good camera. I really, it really just seems like they started off with the good camera that cost a thousand dollars in their product line, and they started taking things off of it to try to figure out how to get that price down to five or six hundred dollars. And it really does show. I mean, they're plasticky, they're they're lightweight, so they're not as heavy and as awful to carry around all day as a real SLR. Uh, so real, gosh, that's 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 nice, Andy. It is a real SLR, uh, but uh, which which uh, but it's still not a great, not as, not as good an experience, I think, as the same amount of money for a compact uh, consumer point and shoot. Uh, but that does bring up another issue that when you build something as an SLR, there are some design problems that you absolutely can't get around because of the definition single lens reflex camera. Um, out of the Yanako archives, thanks to the MI, thanks to about ten dollars in the MIT flea market, I do own an Olympus uh, OM10 SLR, which was just one of the most popular cameras of the 70s and 80s, so just monster kit uh, consumer SLR, uh, and it shows you what is meant by SLR. It has two features that uh, you can't get around. One is that uh, the light comes in here, bounces around, and then goes in through here through the through the uh, through the eyepiece. So you have this little periscope that has to be part of the package. Uh, also, you have to have what's called a mirror box. Uh, this big big chunk down here that re that represents a flappy mirror uh, in front of a shutter. So the mirror has to sh uh, the, the bottom part of the periscope has to flap out of the way when you when you uh, tap the shutter so the result as a result there are limitations to exactly how compact you can make this because you have to have that periscope you have to have that box uh, for it to go in and also given that this is a, a lens style that is set by this huge family of lenses that's available for Nikon and uh, Nikon and 
uh, and, and Canon, uh, it, the lens mount has to be this big, which means that there always has to be a minimum distance between here and the uh, and the plane of the image sensor. So you're never going to – you can make a, a consumer SLR that's compact, but it's never going to be really compact, certainly not as uh, – compact is what you'd get uh, in the new camera technologies that have come out since then. The only other nice thing about it is that uh, you can, because this is completely optical, you can actually be you know, looking through it and composing without necessarily burning out, burning up uh, the energy that would be cost with a uh, uh, with an LCD display here or electronic viewfinder here. That's the only other nice thing I can really I can really say about it. Uh, otherwise, I would tend to steer people into a compact system camera. Now this is defined by everything that the SLR is not. Uh, this is kind of like uh, the the way that they when they when they were designing the uh, the uh, lunar lander at, uh, for the Apollo program, they realized that oh wait, we don't need seats because this is operating in zero gravity. And wow, we actually also don't need to have an engine that can be uh, of this design because if we just put two engines on it, we don't we can we can uh, uh, remove all this clutter and all this complexity. So once you design a camera with the idea that we don't need a, a, a prism because people are going to be view using this as a viewfinder, so we don't need that. Uh, and also we can design this to be smaller, to use smaller size lenses. And so the principles of optics say that now we can make this uh, distance uh, a lot less, a uh, lot less uh, narrow. Uh, and also uh, that uh, the the fact that uh, the shutter is electro is uh, not uh, a, doesn't require a flappy uh, periscope. That also makes it smaller too. So a lot of these are tiny, tiny, tiny cameras. Uh, this was the camera that replaced uh, that replaced this one. Uh, I, I said that I've been shopping f uh, for the past four or five years. I've been thinking that it's time for me to get a, a new decent camera. Uh, and this was the one that I bought because two or three, a couple of years ago, I was ready, but I didn't think there was one on the market that really fit all my needs. And boy, this really got me excited about uh, compact system cameras. This uses the Micro Four Thirds standard. Uh, most of the compact system cameras have a uh, uh, have their own uh, lens standards. Micro Four Thirds is uh, the most popular because it's been around the longest. Uh, it's it's co-owned by uh, Olympus and Panasonic, the first two companies to make cameras uh, of this standard. And so there's not only the widest library of lenses out there, but also the most high quality lenses out there. Uh, and it does give you the same the feature that you really associate with having a nice SLR, which is the ability to do this. Take off this little uh, lens that I tend to use when I'm at parties because it's small and it's pocketable and it uses uh, and it uh, is very very bright. I did not anticipate doing a lens change live during this program, but there you go. And now I can simply snap this on here, and despite the size, this is a tiny camera. I can have essentially a 400 millimeter zoom lens attached to it. Uh, and when I upgraded to this camera, now I can take either of those two lenses and use it on this one, despite the fact that these are two such very different sized uh, and purposed cameras. I mean, this is you know, this is, look this I look like a tourist. This look this I look like well like a tourist who doesn't know how to manage his money or a pro that is confident enough in, him, in himself and his uh, self-image to not have to have the enormous Nikon or, or Canon uh, branded SLR around his neck at all times. Uh, and there's such variety here. You can spend as little as $400 for one of these with a lens. Uh, you can spend about four or five times that much. Uh, about, I think they top out at about $1,800 for the really nice pro ones. Uh, but uh, there, And there are all kinds of choices in between, and that's the nice thing about it. If you want something that's really pocketable, you can get something that's really pocketable. If you want something that has a lot more bells and whistles uh, and is, let's say, purseable as opposed to pocketable, you can get that too. So there's so many options available to you. That's why I have such difficulty recommending a consumer-grade SLR. With all of these options out there, I just don't know why I would why I would not tell somebody to go get a compact uh, system, compact camera. Now, uh, Micro Four Thirds is only one standard after... 
Um, Olympus and Panasonic had some success with this stuff, and they started building cameras second generation and third generation that started getting a lot of respect. Other companies got into the action. Uh, I like uh, Fuji and Sony. They're the uh, Fuji, Sony, Olympus, and Panasonic are the four that are doing, I think, exceptional things with this category. Uh, so if you take a look at those lines, you really can't go uh, go very far from from wrong. Uh, and then another thing that I, sh I should mention about it, there's a because I think it's I think it's interesting that. Uh, the because the distance between the end of uh, the lens mount and the sensor is so small there's a little quirk that says that now this can use pretty much any lens that you like uh, so i started off with uh, a nikon nikon slrs uh, years ago so i have not a not a, a really great collection of nikon glass but i have a few lenses and because uh, of that uh, of that distance all i have to do is add this to the back of any of my nikon lenses and it will work just fine uh, with this tiny, tiny little camera or this uh, big, big one, uh, because, like I said, that needs it, this lens needs a minimum distance from the uh, from the sensor or the film plane in order to work. So this just simply increases that distance so that it works. You can't do that with an SLR if you have one lens mount. Uh, only through spending so much money for really crazy adapters uh, could you actually use one lens mount with another. Uh, so it's not worth it. So it makes it a lot more fun. It also means that if you're not thinking about buying lenses in the future. You can rent lenses. I'm, I'm not sure that I can ever justify two thousand dollars for a proper sports uh, zoom lens. Uh, but gee, if I'm at a really, good, if I'm ever invited to a really cool sporting event, I'll be willing to spend sixty or seventy dollars to rent one for a week and and try it that way, and then send it back. If I have a uh, compact system camera, especially a micro four thirds camera, I can certainly rent that glass, or I can rent a Canon or Nikon lens and just get the right adapter for my Sony or for my uh, Fuji. Um, I do think that uh, 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 between those four makes, hard to say no to any of them because they're all very good. Uh, I one of the reasons I will say that one of the reasons why I wound up picking this Olympus, and maybe sometime in the future I'll either write about or talk about specifically why I bought this camera. Um, I think that one of the reasons why this is so exceptional is because this is emphatically the end result of a company that's been making these cameras for about five or six years. They have learned, they have made every mistake that they needed to make, they have had consumers tell them every piece of feedback they needed to get, and now they have put all of that knowledge into this really wonderful camera. And the same is true, I think, of most of the Panasonics and most of the Olympuses. Fuji, they, they take fantastic pictures, but I still think there's some dross in there that this is not quite so efficiently designed and gee this button placement doesn't work very well and gee they really are stuck with the idea that they have to build it like a film camera when if they were building it digitally from the ground up they could think about uh, the possibilities there sony too is, is sony is not as the, the same i don't feel the same way as strongly uh, as with fuji but also they, they're, they're experimenting with full framed uh, mirrorless uh, cameras and they're amazing that a uh, digital camera with a Im image sensor that's as big as a 35 millimeter frame of film is that that tiny but it really does look like we did this to win a bar bet and maybe try to sell as many as we could to justify doing the next generation of this this is what scared me off of the uh, the uh, the uh, sony alphas that have that new technology as tempting as it was to have a camera with a big sensor in it like that uh it, that's what really scared me off of it um, so after compact mirrorless, is, is you get to uh, what you'd call a premium point and shoot. I don't have any of those in the office because I review them. I send them back, unfortunately. Uh, the, like the Sony RX100, now they're up to the Mark III. These are expensive point and shoot cameras. That whereas the ones that I was talking about early, the ones I was talking about earlier could cost you again three to five hundred dollars. Now we're talking about ones that cost six, seven, eight, even nine hundred dollars. And Boy, do they take great pictures! I mean, the 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 RX100 Mark III, it's like you get the you look at the sample photos, and you hear the pitch from the engineers and the PR people, and you're like, yeah, right. I'm, yeah, let's. Can you pull back to? Thanks for the sample photos. Can you show me the studio that this was shot in, where all the light was perfectly balanced and perfectly this? And then you try it out, and oh my God, it just it's a it's the size. It looks like a two hundred dollar camera that you got bought in a blister pack at a pharmacy because you know you drop your real camera off the side of a boat. That's that's what it looks like, but it's taken pictures that you'd be hard pressed to find any fault with them or. If you mix them up with uh, real professional SLRs, so often you'd have a hard time telling which one is which. They're that good. Um, 
there's definitely a market for it. Um, I'm. <sighs> Uh, they, they're not my kind of camera, only because, uh, for instance, the uh, for all that money that you spend on the uh, RX100 Mark III, it doesn't have a hot shoe. You can't put a flash on it. And the first time you put even a $50 flash on a camera and start taking pictures with it instead of with the on-camera flash, that's when you realize what a good investment that even that $40 or $50 are. Um, so I, I'm more of the sort. I, I'm more of the kind of guy who likes to have the intimacy. If I'm not taking pictures with a with a phone, I like to have the intimacy of messing around with things and having a little bit more control and not having to say, okay, well, I guess the I'm at the limits of the zoom and I can't put on another lens. Oh well, it cost me nine hundred dollars, but I'm gonna have to take what I take and then put this camera back in my pocket. That's not a fault of the RX100. That is simply uh, a disconnection between how this camera takes pictures and how I take pictures. At least when I spend that much money on a camera. But yeah, if you have that kind of budget and you want you really don't want to have to mess around with a camera at all you really want that push this one button functionality and you don't ever want to be in a situation where you're embarrassed to take out a camera uh, this is a nice compact uh, camera but uh, it's still something that I have to wear around my neck uh, that that's definitely the definitely the way to go uh, then you get into what I would call enthusiast, or actually I and the industry would call an enthusiast SLR. These are where you start getting Canon and Icon cameras that SLRs that are designed to be real cameras. They didn't really cut any corners. We're talking about like the Nikon uh, uh, 7100. Uh, great, great body. It, they cut only a few. They, they didn't cut any corners. They just didn't add some of the ruggedness that you would get in a professional camera. Things that anyone who is not a professional would never miss in a million years. Uh, these are the cameras that cost $1,000, $1,100, $1,200, $1,300. Um, that's probably the... Uh, see, the, again, two, just a few years ago, that would have been the natural place that I would have wound up. Uh, after I had grown out of uh, this camera. Yeah, this was designed to be, I thought of this as a stopgap camera. I'd reviewed this. I got one on loan for review, and I liked it so much that after I sent it back, I just had to buy one for myself because I just liked the way that it worked. I liked the pictures I was taking with it. Um, and so normally, when you after you step up, if you want to step up from a camera like this where I'm going to start investing in really good lenses and I'm going to take these things seriously, and I'm gonna, of course I have to have a Nikon or a Canon SLR, big black SLR on my neck, and I'm going to wave it around, and people will know that I'm a real photographer because look, I've got a big Nikon SLR around my neck. I don't know why they talk like a, a male version of Katherine Hepburn, but something sometimes that does it to you when you are carrying a big SLR around your neck. Um, that would be the natural progression. Now I think things have changed a lot because the greatest makers of these types of cameras are still Nikon and Canon, and they are pretty excuse me as of 2014 they're still fairly dyed in the wool they're still making essentially the same cameras in this line they've been making for the past three four or five years whereas this one is has learned every single lesson you can possibly learn uh, from f the way people use uh, phone camera apps the way people use new compact cameras uh, the way that uh, people like to have instant gratification of editing photos and or moving it right from the camera onto the phone so you can post it immediately Immediately. Uh, and it's not just a, a like a Wi-Fi chip that and radio that they managed to shoehorn into the body. It was designed around this feature, uh, and the, the the app is designed around all this sort of stuff. You just don't see that kind of thinking with I think these enthusiast level thousand dollar to thirteen fourteen hundred dollar Canon and Icon cameras. Um, so unless you are a very very faithful photographer, a very faithful Canon and Icon shooter, uh, I would really uh, even. Uh, I wouldn't make that my first choice, even if that is your first go-to thought. I really do encourage you to think about cameras like this, and some of them cost as much as that uh, than, as that seventy-one hundred, as that enthusiast uh, Nikon or Canon SLR. Uh, but boy, I feel like I get so much more uh, camera for the same amount of money, or even a little bit less uh, than I would if had I gotten uh, with uh, with that other camera. Um, there's some psychology too, but I think we'll save that for uh, for another category. Um, next step up from that, the enthusiast SLR would be what you'd call uh, premium compact mirrorless uh, cameras. These are the ones that uh, they're still mirrorless cameras, uh, but put it this way, there's probably a YouTube video from the manufacturer showing you the manufacturing process about how every part is sanded, not by machine, but by hand, and not by hand, but by withered old hands that do nothing but sand down camera parts since the Vietnam War 
ever. This is the legacy, and this is also why this camera costs five thousand dollars, even though it doesn't really take much better pictures than the five thousand dollar camera that you might have bought instead. <gasps> that sort of thing. Um, uh, so, uh, as as you might guess, I'm not the biggest fan in the world of these types of cameras. Uh, I'm not again. I, I don't denigrate them, but it you get to the point where uh, imagine, or maybe you won't have to imagine, depending on how much time I put into this. Imagine a curve where the amount of money that you spend on the camera is on this axis, and the quality of the image is on this axis. You wind up with a curve that starts uh, approaching the, a maximum line. Uh, in a in a in a in a, a Zeno's paradox sort of way, it keeps getting asymptotically, it just gets closer and closer and closer without ever getting there. So there's a big big leap when you spend go from spending three hundred dollars to say a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars, and then as you keep on going closer, you're spending a lot more money to get a little bit closer to perfect and a little bit closer to perfect and a little bit closer to perfect. And if you're a professional, that one oddball situation in which a really nice $1,300 camera can't do the job of your full thousand dollar premium super premium compact camera or any other camera that's if if you really and for those people that really is worth a thousand dollars for most people you're just sort of into the aesthetic uh, of enjoying having this really nicely machined device and that's fine too. I mean, if you have the money to spend on that, uh, the, the, I have friends who collect watches, and they they have watches that cost a lot of money because it's not just about telling time; it's about the appreciation of this really, really nicely put together device that gives them pleasure just to look at it and see how nicely fitted everything is, and turn it around, around the other side. Uh, I don't have share that sort of love. I just think that gee, for eighteen dollars, I go to really a claw machine at an arcade and before i put four dollars in i will get an lcd watch that takes keeps better time than your two thousand dollar watch and i feel the same way about these cameras that they're hard to recommend uh, unless you're a real aesthetic uh, real aesthete uh, about these sort of things um I, the only and the only one left after this is the pro slr and i will admit that uh, part of my journey towards buying this was in dissuading myself of this romantic notion that I have a need for professional SLR. I don't. If you're watching this YouTube video to get some advice on buying a pro SLR, you probably don't need one either because you're not coming to YouTube for this stuff. You should be coming to, you have specific knowledge of the specific ways that your existing cameras are letting you down. Uh, and you know exactly the difference between professional cameras and even something that is exceptionally good consumer and exceptionally good enthusiast cameras. Um, this is a category that confuses me a lot because I go, to, I go to a lot of conferences, I go to a lot of trade shows. I have a lot of friends that I see really only at you know Apple events and Samsung events and other and like you know Mobile World Congress. And I will see them. They're not photojournalists. They're not taking pictures. They are just out walking around all day. Uh, and they have a Canon EOS. They have, they have a Canon uh, 5D Mark III, like a really expensive professional. This is the this is the 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 standard professional camera. The the EOS uh, uh, the five the uh, 5D Mark III. Uh, and they're just taking snapshots with it. And for all I know, they are really, really hardcore enthusiasts, and they really appreciate the difference between this $4,000 camera and one that would have cost them only a third as much. Uh, I don't see it in the way they're using it. Uh, if they have Flickr feeds, I get to, I see, wow, I want to see, I really want to see the pictures this person was taking with that, with that $4,000 camera. And I see, yeah, that's huge had no idea of where the light source was and he didn't use the correct shutter speed and I mean I'm not I'm not judging him but I'm, I'm saying that I just don't see where he was exploiting all or, or she was exploiting all the money that they put into that camera and this it's a big honking camera so this is the last likely now the last uh, the, the the first and last professional camera I ever bought um this is the uh, Nikon uh, D200 which old old camera I bought it used uh, it was a, a, I think it was a wedding photographer's backup camera. Because this is the bottom of the Nikon professional line at the time, and also even when I bought it, it was about a generation or two uh, too old. It only goes up to 1600 ISO, uh, which even at the time that I bought it was just not a, a high ISO. Uh, oddly, for a pro, pro camera, it had a has a uh, built-in flash. That's such a pain in the butt to not uh, have built-in flash. That's the only thing I don't like about this. To make it compact, they don't put a, a built-in flash on it, but hey, I deal with it. Uh, but it sh look how big this thing is. And that, that's something that's often kind of lost. Uh, let me get the OM-10 again. 
we forget that this is how big an SLR used to be. He said, carefully balancing the pro camera on his side. It's so small that I can hide it with my hand. Uh, and now we have, this is about the size of not even a pro camera anymore. Even that 7100 is pretty darn big. Uh, and it's such a monster to have to carry around. Uh, but boy, was it, boy, is it fun to shoot with something like this. That's, that's the reason why maybe you have a, a pro camera. Uh, because it is solid, it feels good. Uh, the thing when you have a pro camera, they put buttons and dials for everything. You, you don't have to ever dig into a menu to find something. You just take this switch right here and you turn it to the setting that you actually want it to, to be because uh, you don't have time for that sort of stuff when you're uh, when you're a pro photographer. It's heavy. It's built. It's You don't worry about it getting rained on. You don't worry about it, uh, about dust uh, swirling up. Like a, a pro camera like the Nikon D800 currently or the, uh, or the 5D, this is like the the AK-47, you know, where it's designed, it, it's like the AK-47, this is for people for whom when they need to shoot, they need that shoot to make something productive happen. There's no excuse for that shot not making the thing happen that that person wanted to happen when they decided to shoot with this thing. So just like an AK-47, you can bury it in a burlap sack in the, in, the, in the jungle and leave it there for a year and then dig it up again and give it a cleaning and it will still fire. You can be sloshing through water with it, salt water, and it will still fire. This, you can bash it against a door, a door jam. You can fall off, a, off of a bus with it and it will still work. Uh, but these aren't things that I really, really need. I will be a little bit more careful with it. I mean, this is nice in that it is waterproof and it is very nicely built, but it's also not nearly as heavy as this thing. Look how big it is too. I mean, uh, getting back to, I should not have too many props here because I keep wanting to reach for them. Um, think, imagine me so many times packing for a trip and these two cameras are on my bed and I realize that I'm going to have to, if I take, I really want, I, I have a lot of ambitions of, I'm going, I've got a day plan just for nothing but walking around and taking pictures and not even randomly taking pictures. There's some pictures I really want to take. And so uh, if I take this, I'm going to have to leave the house with this around my neck and wear it until I check into my hotel because I can't really carry a bag, a, a separate bag to put this in. And every time if I'm meeting people for dinner, but I've got four hours before that, I will have to show up for dinner wearing this around my neck and that's why so many times I was leaving this at home and just simply traveling with this because this is all that I could really feel like uh, I could deal with for three or four days uh, out of my office uh, so it was really uh, counterproductive to own a camera like this but like, like I said I don't uh, your default position on a pro quality camera should probably be no you don't need it uh, what you need is technique uh, what you might need not is if you've got four thousand dollars to spend on camera is to buy a nice camera like this for one quarter of that and then spend two thousand dollars on really exceptional lenses for it and still have a thousand dollars left over to fly to someplace pretty and take pictures uh, or for classroom instructions for lynda.com uh, subscriptions or for software for Photoshop for that sort of stuff uh, if you have a budget for taking good pictures probably your money is not very well spent on a pro camera. That's all I'm saying. And if you are fighting me on this, if you're saying, no, no, you're wrong. I need a pro camera. I can only, there are things my life is a empty, empty, vulgar gesture without my having a big pro camera. Okay, if you want to fight for it, uh, then maybe you should think about it. If you've got so much money that you can spend $4,000 on a pro camera that you might not actually use, that's also cool too. You certainly know your needs better than I do. What I'm saying is that don't get hung up on the idea that, gee, I'm taking photography seriously, so I definitely need to have a pro quality camera. You don't. All you need is a decent camera that really fits well uh, with, with your style of shooting. Um, and that's the last... Uh, really the last lesson uh, of all this, uh, that there's so much more to it than just the sensor, so much more to it than even the lens or the body. It really is if a camera that suits your shooting style. Um, you think about how, quote, bad, unquote, your family photos were from your, that your, your grandparents, uh, the shoebox full of photos that they left behind. They shot these things with crappy cameras. This is the next item in the Andianatko parade of for former cameras. This is a 110 cartridge uh, camera. It takes tiny, tiny, tiny little st uh, f strips of film. Uh, and it was my first pretty much decent camera uh, out there in the sense that it had both normal and telephoto lenses. 
uh, that work that way. As a matter of fact, this isn't the exact one because mine actually, see this panel where there's nothing? I had the model that had variable focus here. Uh, best Christmas present I ever got because this is when I started to really get into photography and start to appreciate uh, how much I, en I can enjoy uh, being, a, uh, being an active part of taking a picture. Uh, and it takes some crummy pictures. It, it, on a technical level, it took crummy pictures, but boy, I still have some of my prints from there and they're still, I think, beautiful. There's some beautiful pictures that I took with it. Uh, it doesn't matter the fact that it's, they're grainy or they're not, they're shot with a plastic lens. They're just good pictures. Uh, the pictures that some of the most brilliant photos ever taken on a technical basis are crap compared to what a $500 camera with a 16 megapixel image sensor is going to give you. It's the fact that the person who used this simple light box camera uh, applied not only knowledge and skill, but also a creative eye. Who is, he or she was very, very effective at letting you into their brain and letting you see how they saw the world. And it had nothing to do with the technical capabilities of that camera. So I, I actually had to sort of shame myself a little bit into thinking that, oh, I, I really can't, I really shouldn't buy another compact system camera because I really, this is, I've got, if, if, if this Nikon 7100 costs the same amount of money and I can have a Nikon SLR with a larger uh, sized uh, image sensor, uh, I should really get that because I know that larger image sensors are technically better. And then, no, they're not necessarily because uh, I'll, t I'll tell you, uh, th this, this might, like I said, this might deserve its own uh, video or this own uh, separate column uh, in that uh, what sold me, one of the things that sold me on this was the fact that this has in-body five axis stabilization. So you can really really be jittering around with this a lot and it will correct it inside the body and no other camera is as good as that. I've been able to hand hold uh, exposures of like one tenth of a second and even less than that and have it just be perfectly sharp. Uh, and if I got myself, if I, one of the things I was trying, I was tripping myself up with is all of these technical information about these different camera sensors on these different model of cameras saying, oh, well, look at the, look at how poorly this performs at 3200 ISO compared to this Fuji compact system camera because it has the, a much larger and a much better sensor. And I said, yeah, but you don't have to shoot a 3200 ISO because you have that stabilization. You can actually get longer, longer exposures at 800 or 1600 and it'll work just fine. So don't be, don't ever try to just Christmas tree your decision by saying, well, this is a pro camera, this is not a pro camera, good, that I want the pro camera. This has a larger sensor, this has a smaller sensor, so therefore obviously, I obviously want the one with the larger sensor. Wrong, wrong, and wrong. So much of this is going to be just about your own peculiarity and how you interact with the world through a camera. Um, I'll close off by giving you uh, some resources that were very useful to me. One that tripped me up, and so even though it's a great site, I'm going to sort of warn you off of it. Um, by far, my favorite review site for, for cameras is DP Reviews. Uh, they do the intensive four, five, six, seven, eight page review, putting it absolutely through its paces, taking weeks to craft the most important review of every single camera that will ever be made by anybody. And sometimes it is more information that you actually require, but you do need to have that one authoritative resource that will have that one review that will have every piece of information that's important. So you might be able to disregard what they say about one thing or another because maybe the maximum flash synchronization speed is not that important to your kind of photography, but this will be a review that talks about the max maximum synchronization speed. Um, so that's that's my go to that's my go to place. Um, there is also uh, an esoteric site that will. Uh, show you the relative size of various cameras. Um, uh, I've forgotten the URL actually, so that will be up, I'm sure, in front of David Byrne's face uh, as I talk about this. Uh, and it's wonderful because so much of uh, your choice is gonna have to be, how does this handle and how much of a bear is this gonna be to deal with as you're walking around with it or uh, trying to store it or trying to pack it. And you can just simply put, well, here is the uh, Fuji 100 and here is the Olympus OMD M1 side by side get a load of how much bigger one is over the other. Uh, this is one of the things that really locked me out of that Nikon 7100, just seeing how much bigger this other camera was going to be and how nice and compact uh, this other one was. Um, I would also recommend, uh, Flickr was also a big, big help uh, because you really, the sample pictures that the manufacturer gives you, they're they're optimized. They're designed to be as good as they can possibly be. Even the sample pictures that a uh, that uh, DP reviews will put up, 
very very good but they are being these are these are photos being taken by someone who does nothing but who spends a lot of time with cameras Flickr is very valuable because you can do a search for pictures taken by a specific camera model and then you can see how real people are using this camera what results are they are they getting and because the picture information is almost always available and attached to the image you can see well how high was the sensitivity on this one what was the shutter speed what mode was it? oh wow that was on full automatic and it looks that beautiful that's really wonderful uh, so that really gives you a hands-on idea of how these things how these things will actually work in real to real uh, basis it's also good because you know what kind of pictures you usually take so if you find someone who also takes a lot of uh, you know backyard uh, backyard hooliganism with your kids and the neighbor kids uh, and you see that this one camera that you're considering it was can take much better pictures than uh, other cameras uh, in the exact same kind of pictures and sort of nice daylight uh, with uh, good color and lots of motion, then that'll give you some information that you, that's going to be valuable, valuable to you. Um, I also really like going onto YouTube and looking for video reviews. Now, um, if I'm not recommending anybody specifically, it's not because I've seen a two dozen. I don't think anyone is, re is worth recommending. It's because it's for the reason why I'm recommending it. It's uh, maybe they maybe their methodology is great. Maybe it isn't. Maybe they're very clear. Maybe they're not very clear. But the really great thing about how they will do this is that you will actually see them see video of them actually operating this and turning it around. And you will see them fumbling to change a setting. You will see where are their hands when they're taking a picture. You know when they are holding it. Do they hold it naturally uh, when they turn it around? Did they were they able to flip out this this uh, this screen very very easily, or do they have to do it in three stages and then curse as they change it around? That's also really valuable information. Um, I will single out one uh, photo video uh, producer, and that's uh, Digital Rev TV, because they're very much the top gear uh, of uh, camera reviews, uh, meaning that they're always entertaining, even if they're not always valuable. Uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, reviewer didn't necessarily like this very much because he thought that well look. It's too big. It's if it's you're gonna make it this big and this chunky, you may as well get an SLR. So what's the point of this? Uh, and uh, but it's always entertaining to watch, and they will be using this camera on video, uh, and it's going to be a lot of fun, uh, lots and lots of fun to watch. Um, they also, to underscore my previous point, they have the uh, uh, pro uh, pro photographer cheap camera challenge, which you should definitely look up, where they take a really talented professional photographer, even sometimes a famous photographer, and they give them a iPhone Mark One or they give them the blister pack $80 Casio uh, camera or they give you the Buzz Lightyear toy camera that has you know maybe two megapixels and no flash and they here's you know we'll, we'll walk around with you you take pictures with it and we'll show people what the pictures you took and I'll be damned they take great pictures with these cheap cameras so really unfortunately this is the this is the failure component whenever I take bad pictures and I have to remind myself of that again always always entertaining um but the last thing that I want to say is that don't, my fault was that there's I, I will there's the the one I'm sorry the one site that I'm saying don't well okay I'll say stay away from it they DXO Mark they do great 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 work they do nothing but test image sensors tech the most detailed spectrographical graphs with multiple colored peaks and places and like scatter things and polar things and people with pipes and, and lab coats and puffing on things and talking about Millerads. Uh, well, that's no, that's a radiation, uh, radiation thing. But you know what I'm talking about. Just the most technical reviews of just the image sensor stuff. And this is the one that I said, oh, aha, that, that's what I really wanted. I really need hard data. This proves categorically that the pictures that, the pictures that this camera takes are crap. I had a lucky escape. And wow, you just spend weeks and weeks and weeks looking at this data that isn't necessarily telling you anything that you as a consumer and even me as a consumer is going to find useful because again um, all it I think that it's easy to no matter how carefully and how usefully they explain their results it's too easy to look at these results and interpret them for your, you, this is on you to interpret them as well this sensor is better than this other sensor and therefore I should buy the Fuji and not the Olympus the sensor is just one part of that stew and the fact that i thought i thought the user interface of this was way better than the fuji it's, most, it's much easier to handle than the fuji the fact that it has that five axis stabilization means that the differences in the sensor are almost irrelevant to what i do i realized that as grateful as i was to the work that dxo mark does and as much as i appreciate the work that they do 
it's not something that you should really mess around with because it will just it's like introducing a dog to the end of his own tail that's you get him starting spinning around chasing it chasing it and chasing it and only until it's feeding time four hours later will you get them to get him to stop doing that and that's what all this data i think will do to most people who are shopping for a camera so but uh, i, I want to before i end goodness this was very this was very long um before i end uh, i want to take take you back to that central idea that it really is all about developing this system up here that sub subliminal process of seeing where the story of the photo is and putting yourself in the right place and aiming this thing at the right direction and clicking the shutter at the right time to make that photo happen uh, and it really is all about composition it's all about and it's also about simple things like where is the light is the light behind this person if so do i want a image in which this person is completely in shadow for effect or is this does this mean I need to turn around and go into the other side? Does this mean that I should, as a tourist, I could I should make sure that I walk back along this path later in the day so that I'm catching this church at sunset instead of high noon where all where the light is is really really terrible? Uh, that's what you should be thinking about. And again, think about the family photos that you have. They were taken with terrible cameras. One of the most the, the, there is a uh, there is a photo that I absolutely treasure and it's this candid picture of my parents at uh, some sort of one of their friends weddings uh, they're sitting on a couch and they're playing around and they're just absolutely happy to be in each other's company and it's a little bit out of focus and there's a lot of grain because you could tell that it was blown up from a, from a very small uh, print or some very small negative but I don't care I care that I have this beautiful picture of my, my, my parents when they're in their mid-20s uh, and just happy to be at this day and happy to be enjoying their company people are not going to really uh, blame you for taking a picture with a camera phone instead of with a four thousand dollar SLR. They're just they're just going to be grateful to you that you managed to keep this and, and take it with you uh, and, and pass it along to future generations. And remember that uh, as good as a lot of this engineering is, as good as the technology is, as good as the hardware is, a lot of that goes away. Just like with the phones I was talking about at the very beginning of this, a lot of that goes away when you spend exactly thirty seconds in a free photo app. Uh, or five minutes in uh, in an eighty dollar photo app, and that's when you, yes, it did a bad job of uh, of tone mapping it, but you can fix that tone map. You wish that the uh, that the reds were quite so green, and you push another slider. Now the reds are not no longer so green, and you wish it were a little bit sharper. So you apply a little bit of sharpening, not not so much to ruin the image. And now that is that eighty that five minutes that you spent editing the image is what would have cost you eight hundred dollars. For a lot of photographers, it's very, very important to not have to apply that to 100 images that they've shot at, a, at an official event and people are waiting for these pictures immediately. For you, maybe there are better ways to spend that $800. Actually, finally, uh, even if you feel as though you do have a, a $2,000 budget or a $4,000 budget, again, think about spend, putting that money elsewhere. Like, this is the last... <laughs> High energy prop comic Andy and Uh This is the last uh, prop that I pulled out of my uh, my closet. Uh, this little GoPro camera that costs all of two hundred fifty dollars. It is one of the nicest accessories you can possibly buy for a camera because you will have in your you you might have your five hundred dollar little uh, uh, point and shoot, but you also have this camera that will can you can take into the water with you that can set up time lapses that you can suction cup into the car and be shooting video like while other people are driving or be shooting uh, uh, leaving it up there all night taking one picture every 30 seconds in case there are animals that are coming through the woods uh, and this is not even a technically terrible uh, wonderful camera but that does things that no other camera can do and is well worth your 250 dollars this is what i'm talking about when i say that even if you want to spend two or three thousand dollars perhaps you should sp you should spread that money around a little bit better there's so many different solutions no one is going to give you the right one and that's why i've decided to spend holy cats yes that much time uh talking about uh generic reasons to shop for cameras and things to look out for so thanks for watching this long and if you were skipping around i don't blame you